In the first century Jewish world, the world of Jesus, there was major debate and discussion around this. At what age do we begin teaching our children Torah? If we start too soon, they may not be sponge-like enough to soak it all in. But if we wait too long, then we might miss that critical opportunity to get the scripture deep inside the bones. And for first century Jews, it was really important for them to get the scripture deep inside the bones of the children because they knew if this didn't happen, they were one generation away from being extinct. Education of their children was central to the life of their community. And there were three stages of education in, Je in Jesus' day. And so what I'd like to do with you is walk through those three stages and then see what all of this has to do with Moana and your life. Are you ready? The first stage was called Bet Sefer. Literally translates as the house of the book. And this would be for children roughly between the ages of 6 and 10. And in Bet Sefer, the children would go to their local synagogue, and they would begin learning from their local synagogue Torah teachers. And they would start memorizing the Torah, the law, the instructions. The first five books of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Levit Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if you're thinking to yourself, now wait a minute. How does a six-year-old memorize Torah? Not possible. Oh, it is possible. It is possible because it's a matter of what we choose to immerse ourselves in. And if you need proof of this, come into my home, sit in my living room, and we'll turn on Moana. And I will show you a six-year-old little girl and a four-year-old little girl who have mastered the art of memorization. <laughs> it is indeed possible. Now, the best of the best of these students would move on to the second stage of education, which is called Bet Talmud. And this would be for children roughly between the ages of 10 and 14. And in Bet Talmud, they would memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, which means by roughly the age of 14, you would have the entire Hebrew scriptures memorized. Now, also in Bet Talmud, they would be learning the beautiful Jewish art of questions. Because for rabbinical studies, it was all about the questions. Question and response. Question and response, which is different than here in the Western world, the contemporary Western world, how we think of question and answer. For instance, if I'm to ask you, what is two plus two, you would respond with four. If you're in rabbinical studies, it's about the questions. So if I'm to ask you what is 2 plus 2, you would respond with something like, well, what is 16 divided by 4? Or what is 5 if you take away 1? It's all about the questions. You might remember a story from Luke's gospel. When Joseph and Mary are taking Jesus and they're traveling into Jerusalem for the Passover feast, Passover festival. They go to the festival, the festival's over, they go back home to Nazareth. They get back to Nazareth and Mary and Joseph look at each other and say, oh my goodness. Where's Jesus? We lost him. He's not here. They have to go back into Jerusalem to find Jesus. Where is Jesus? Luke chapter 2. In the temple. The only time we're told Jesus' age. How old was Jesus? Twelve years old. What was he doing? The text tells us he was in the temple talking with the religious leaders, asking them questions. Why? Bet Talmud. Now, each rabbi had a particular yoke, and a yoke is a particular set of their interpretations. One of the great ways we can understand a yoke is to look at some of the discussion among rabbis in the first century when it came to Sabbath. Because what you would have is these lively debates among the rabbis. And you'd have a rabbi say, well, according to the scriptures, on Sabbath, we can do this and this and this but we cannot do this and this and this. And another rabbi would come along and say, no, 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 that's nonsense. That's a bad interpretation. Let me give you a better interpretation. When it comes to the Sabbath, according to the scriptures, we can do this and this and this, but we must not do this and this and this. And they would go back and forth. Do you remember what Jesus said about his rabbi, about his, uh, his yoke? 
Rabbi Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, my yoke is light. It isn't about an endless list of rules. Fascinating, isn't it? The best of the best of the best of these students moved on to that third stage, which is called Bet Midrash. And in Bet Midrash, the student would go to a rabbi of authority and say to that rabbi, I want to be your student. I want to be your Talmud, your disciple. I want to learn your yoke. And then the rabbi would begin firing questions at the student. And the student would respond to those questions and they would be quoting the text back and forth, back and forth, because this rabbi is asking himself, does this student have what it takes to not just learn my yoke, but do they have what it takes to teach and spread my yoke? Now, if that rabbi believed that you had what it takes, the rabbi would look at you and say these words, come follow me. And in that moment, you would drop everything to follow that rabbi. You would give up your life to be like that rabbi because that rabbi believes you can be like him. If the rabbi would eat, you would eat. And when the rabbi would sleep, you would sleep. And when the rabbi would pray, you would mimic those prayers. Now, the truth is, many, most of the students we're told, I'm sorry, you will not be continuing with me today. You do not have what it takes to be my Talmud, my disciple. So you must go back home and ply the trade, learn the family business. Matthew chapter 4, hear this story. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Why were they fishermen? They were back home plying the trade. And Jesus said to them, come, follow me. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And he went from there. He saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Why? I mean, why did these young fishermen drop everything to follow Jesus? Was it because there was some sort of guilt and baggage that came along with this? I don't know. Rabbi came along and this dude just said we should follow him. So we left our livelihoods, left our families, and we followed after him. We have no clue what it's about. Or was it because Jesus had some sort of mysterious, glorious glow about him? And they said, oh, this, this blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, this one with the great smile, this is the one we need to follow. <laughs> no. A rabbi came to them and said, you're good enough. You have what it takes. I want you to be my Talmud, my disciple. You don't have to pass all the tests. I want you to come and follow me. I mean, how often do you hear people talk about a sense of calling in their life? And it's attached with baggage and guilt, and it's completely lacking of joy. I mean, I hear people in ministry talk about this. Some pastors, missionaries. And they'll say, man, I had this great life. Had a job that I really loved. I was thriving in it. Good family, active in the community. But then God just came along and snatched me up. Called me into ministry and here I am now and I'm miserable. Don't know what I'm doing here. And you're like, dude, where's the joy in come follow me? If it's completely lacking of joy, then maybe you miss something along the way. And by the way, what does all this have to do with Moana? When Moana is standing at the shore, she senses that the ocean is calling her to go beyond the reef. She's always looking towards the horizon. 
And the ocean in the film, if you haven't seen it, the ocean is a very literal character. It's the thing that calls her. It's the thing that persuades her. It's the thing that says, come follow me. And when she decides to follow this thing, it is not out of guilt. It is not lacking of joy. It has, she, she has joy about it. She has excitement. She even has some fear because she's being called to save her people, to go beyond the reef so that her island can be restored back to fullness and health. And even when life has a way of pulling her away from this thing, the ocean has a better way of pulling her back. Take a look at the scene. What calls you? And have you ever felt like this? Like the thing or the things that are calling you, they just have a way of bringing you back. And if that's you, go with it. Go with it. If there's energy there, go with it. Because that's where real joy is found. That's where life is found. And I wonder if God is always, constantly calling us to come follow me. Come follow me. Is God constantly calling us beyond the reef, beyond the place that's safe and comfortable and secure? A couple of observations about this idea of calling. When it comes to your calling, you might have a hundred reasons of why you shouldn't follow this thing, why you shouldn't go after it. There might be people in your life, like Moana had in her life, people that say to you, no, 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 this isn't the way we do it. This isn't the way our people operate. This isn't how we do it. You can't go beyond the reef. You need to stay where it's safe and secure. You might have institutions in your life that say the same message. Or worse yet, you might become your own worst enemy because you can conjure up hundreds of reasons up here of why you're not good enough, of why you're not competent enough, you don't have what it takes, you have some sort of dicey past, you have some sort of checkered present. Oh, I can't do that. But here's the thing. God is not interested in perfect people. God is interested in people who will come and follow. The Apostle Paul says to this new church, this new congregation in Corinth, he's writing to the people, the Corinthian people, and early in the first chapter of his letter. Now, these are people who have experienced a calling. They're down the road a little bit, and here's what he says to them. Take a good look, friends at who you were when you got called into this life. God chose what is foolish in the world. God chose what is weak in the world. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not so that no one might boast in the presence of God. Because have you ever followed that sense of calling in your life? And you went, you went after it, you got down the road a bit, and then sometimes the tendency can be to look back and you say, oh, look at me. Look at what I did. We get puffed up about ourselves. Look at what I built. Have you ever heard people say that? I built it. Oh, come on. Paul says, remember who you were when you were called into this. What are the things that call you? What are you being pulled towards? Second observation about this idea of calling when it comes to your calling, don't ever reduce it to your vocation. You know what I mean? And don't let people around you reduce it to your vocation because it's way more than that. It's who you are. You know, I was recently asked the question, Ryan, tell us, how are you creating? How are you helping to create more pastors in the world? And the whole time I'm being asked this, I'm thinking, oh my goodness. I cannot imagine a more uninteresting question than that one. Because the truth is, I don't care about creating more pastors in the world. What I care about is helping to create more people who live into the person who God has called them to be. What I care about is helping to create people who actually believe that Rabbi Jesus is calling them too to come follow me. You know what I mean? Because my hunch is, out of this room, most of you, not many of you are being called to 
get into the pastorate, right? Not many of you are being called into some sort of formalized ministry. And if you are, great, let's talk. But my hunch is most of you know exactly what it's like to experience that sense of calling that calls you to be more present as a father, calls you to be more present in your marriage, or calls you to actually go after that blog or that book that you've been dreaming about, or that thing that calls you to make amends in some relationships that have gone wrong in your life, to offer forgiveness where you've wronged people, or to accept forgiveness from people, maybe even starting with yourself. I mean, where is God saying to you, come follow me? Go after it. And when you do so, go after it with joy and a great deal of humility. Because remember who you were when you were called into this. And can I speak for just a moment about the power of naming it? Because I think it's so easy to miss the power, the simple power of naming it. You know, most of you know that last week I was on an island with a team of people. We were partnering with Project Humanity on an island called Rusinga Island in Kenya, Africa, very western Kenya, sitting on, the lake, of, uh, sitting on uh, lake Victoria. And it was my third trip to Rusinga Island. And my first trip there, so two years ago, uh, one of my missions was to be with a, a few people from the team and then go to this local church where we were working with a group of about 15 or 20 people. And we were working with them to empower them to know and share their stories. And then on our last day there, it was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had, uh, we invited them to start sharing their dreams with one another. And the stories were so powerful. So powerful. A couple of them I asked, I, I had my iPhone, I said, can I capture this on video? I would love to share this with the world because I think it will inspire other people. One of those stories was a, a lady by the name of Zainabu, who's a friend of mine to this day. I said, Zainabu, your story is incredibly powerful. I would love to share it with the world. And she says, oh, no, 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 pasta. They call me pasta. Not to be confused with the spaghetti noodles. <laughs> pasta. I can't do that because I don't know if this dream will ever come true. Uh, may, maybe it's too big. Maybe it's not realistic enough. And I said, Zainabu, I mean, that's the thing about dreams. We, we throw them out there. We go after them. And then we let God do what is. And so she says, okay, okay, okay. I, I can do it. So she stands beside the church. I film it on my iPhone. And she shares this very moving story about what it's been like for her to raise her boys being a widow. Because you see Rusinga Island, it is one of the poorest communities in the world. It also has one of the highest HIV rates in the world. So there's lots of widows with y young children. And she tells the story, the struggles of that, and then she starts getting into her dreams. And she had this dream of having a center where widows and children could come and experience safe space. Now fast forward two years to the day. And I'll tell you how I know it's two years to the day in just a moment. Tammy and I were there working with this same group of people at the same local church. And on our last day there, just last week, the pastor shows up and he joins the group, which can always be a bit dicey when the pastor joins the group because pastors like to do this, right? And he talked the entire time. And here's how he started. He says, Pasta, can I tell you what's happening here? I said, please do. And he reaches in his briefcase and he pulls out this letter and he's, he's got all sorts of pride with it. And he says, we are partnering with this organization. And he points over to his school and around the church. And he says, the children here, their education will be sponsored and paid for. And then he starts pointing around the property. And I kid you not, he was sitting in the exact same spot where Zainabu was sitting two years ago when I filmed her story. Exact same spot. And he starts pointing around the property. And he says, we're going to build this. 
and the kids are going to come here, and the kids are going to have a safe space here because sexual abuse is rampant in Rusinga Island. And he starts talking about how there's going to be safe space for these children. And then he says to me, Pasta, do you know Zainabu? And I says, yes, I know her very well. And she's sitting just a few seats down from him. And he says, I have asked her, because she is such a committed member of this community, I have asked her to be the assistant pastor because I can't be here all the time. And we will need someone to oversee these operations. And I look over at Zainabu, and she has this huge smile. And I want to run to her and like shake her and high five her and say, do you remember two years ago? Do you remember? This is the dream that you spoke. And look at what God is doing right here, right now. And how do I know it was two years ago to the day? Because when we got back to our lodging later that afternoon, I opened my Facebook app. And it said, two years ago on this day, this is what you were doing. And it was her video. <laughs> I mean, come on. My brothers and sisters, what are you being called towards? What are the things that pull you? Where is God saying to you, come follow me? You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have all the steps figured out. You just got to take the first step. You don't have to have a perfect past or a perfect present. It was Rabbi Jesus who went to fishermen who didn't pass the test and said, come follow me. Go after it with joy and humility and remember who you were when you were called into this. And when doubts arise, and you give yourself a hundred reasons of why you can't do this thing. And you start asking the questions of, oh, well, why, why is God choosing me? If God is so powerful, why can't God just do it on his own? Why does God need me? Wrong question. Uninteresting question. The better question is, God is calling you. What are you going to do with it?